I'm Athena Akrami, a group leader at Science Very Welcome Center, University College London in UK. Today, I will talk about the work that I did as a founding member of the Patient Led Research Collaborative in collaboration with Body Quality COVID 19 support group and sponsored by UCL. Our patient led research team is formed by long COVID patients who all fell ill in spring 2020. We have backgrounds in survey design, qualitative research, public policy data science, machine learning, and statistics, as well as medical research, psychiatry, and neuroscience. We conducted an online survey of people with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, distributed our survey via various support groups and social media. Survey was translated in nine languages and launched in September 2020. More than 7,000 respondents from 87 countries participated and completed our study. In this survey, we had more than 250 questions to investigate disease a duration and severity, a symptom profile and time course, impact on work and life, as well as antibody testing, diagnostics, medical support, coping, and mental health. The data that I'm going to show you today comes from a data set from a cohort of 3,762 participants with illness onset between December 2019 and May 2020. So we could characterize symptoms over seven months. They were all sick for more than 28 days and 92% of them were non-hospitalized and they were distributed across a wide range of ages and only 6.8% were recovered at the time of survey. Our survival analysis shows that in our cohort, more than 92% of respondents still had symptoms after 25 weeks. Those who were recovered on average were sick for 91 days and their symptom count picked in week two. Those who weren't recovered at the time of the survey were on average sick for 144 days and their symptom count peaked in month two. Out of 64 symptoms that were measured over time, the non-recovered participants had on average 14 symptoms after six months and 21% of participants experienced these symptoms severe or very severe. We investigated more than 200 symptoms in 10 different organ systems as listed here. And this table shows the overall symptom prevalence in these 10 organ systems. And the table is sorted by prevalence. Almost all participants had experienced uh, symptoms in neuropsychiatric, systemic, and head, ear, eye, nose, and throat categories. After that, musculoskeletal, pulmonary, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal symptoms were extremely common, impacting more than 85% of participants. Then reproductive, genitary, endocrine, and dermatologic symptoms had prevalence of about 60%, and then immunologic autoimmune systems had prevalence of about 21%. So just to briefly show you the, the details of symptoms for each organ system. So as you see that we had measured many symptoms, and a lot of them were extremely uh, prevalent. Out of systemic symptoms, I'd like to highlight post-exertional malaise, which is worsening of symptoms after mental or physical exertion. And this is linked to also the remitting relapsing nature of long COVID condition this is extremely common. More than 80% of participants were experiencing a PEM. And there are various triggers and the onset can be variable. It can be a couple of hours, a couple of days, and can last several days. Out of 200 symptoms, uh, 64 were measured continuously over seven months. And as you can see, most symptoms had a prolonged probability of, of occurrence throughout the seven month period. We also estimated the distribution of onset time for each symptom. This plot shows the mean onset and the 95% confidence interval around that. And as you can see, some symptoms start early in the first couple of weeks and some start much later after week uh, eight or 10. We also cluster symptoms according to uh, the shape of their time course, that is changes in relative amplitude over time, ignoring their overall prevalence. And symptoms for three clusters. Cluster one consists of symptoms that are most likely to occur early in the illness, reaching a high point in the first two or three weeks, then decreasing in probability over time. Cluster two consists of symptoms with a relatively stable probability over time. Cluster three consists of symptoms most likely to increase sharply in the first two months. Their probability then may plateau or decrease slightly or increase slightly in later months. I would like to note that symptoms with similar time courses are distributed across multiple organ systems. So all clusters contain symptoms from multiple organ systems. Focusing on neuropsychiatric symptoms, they were exclusively clustered in two and three, meaning that they either had relatively stable probability over time or their probability increased sharply in the first two months, then remained stable. 
Moreover, remaining symptoms after month six were mostly systemic and neurological. And as you can see here, more than 70% still experienced brain fog and more than 50% experienced memory-related issues. Let's dive a little bit in the details of our neuropsychiatric symptoms. So we have subcategories of neuropsychiatric symptoms here sorted by their prevalence. Sensory motor is the most prevalent one, impacting about 90% of participants. Then emotion and mood, cognitive dysfunction, with prevalence about 85%. Then we have sleep, headache, and memory categories with prevalence about 70%. Then smell and taste-related symptoms, speech and language, uh, about half of the participants, and uh, at the end, hallucinations, about 15%. So among the sensory motor symptoms, uh, with overall prevalence of 90%, the vertigo and balance issues, as well as paresthesia, tremor, and numbness were the most common ones, but there are others with pretty significant prevalence as well. So among emotion and mood category, with overall prevalence of about 90%, anxiety, irritability, and depression were most common. Among cognitive dysfunction, with overall prevalence of about 85%, brain fog, uh, attention deficit, and problem with executive functioning and problem solving were extremely common. Please see Hannah David's talk after me for details on impact of memory and cognitive dysfunction on life and work. Then we have a sleep category with overall, overall prevalence of about 80%, and insomnia and interrupted uh, sleep were the most common ones. And it's very important to note that only a small fraction of those who experienced sleep issues during their uh, long COVID experience, they had a pre-existing prior symptoms before their COVID-19 infection. Here are different subtypes of headache with overall prevalence of about 76%. Um, then memory issues with overall prevalence of 72%. And short-term memory loss was the most prevalent one in this category. And after that, problems related to long-term memory recall. About 60% of participants experienced various issues with their smell and taste sensation, some with total loss, some with altered sensation or random smell and taste. About half of participants experienced speech and language related issues, mainly with regard to difficulty finding the right word or communicating verbally or in writing, as well as issues with their non-primary languages if they were speaking a second language. About 15% of participants had visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations. So important to note that some symptoms that are grouped as non-neuropsychiatric might have neurological motor components, like sensitivity to light and noise, swallowing issues, temperature dysregulation, weaknesses, skin sensations, some breathing issues, postural tachycardia syndrome, or in general, symptoms related to dysautonomia. And at the end, I would like to add that from what we know so far about possible involvement of CNS in COVID-19, either via direct infection or indirect peripheral to CNS signaling, the neuroinflammation or altered CNS function can cause myriad of ongoing symptoms that can be systemic, generalized, or cognitive neurological as we have discussed in detail in an opinion piece in a review article, which is now in revision. In summary, respondents experienced symptoms in an average of nine organ systems out of 10, and all participants experienced neuropsychiatric symptoms. Most frequent neuropsychiatric symptoms were sensory motor, emotional mood, cognitive dysfunction, sleep, headache, and memory. The most frequent symptoms after month six were mainly neurologic and systemic, and top three were fatigue, post exertional anomalies, and cognitive dysfunction. And all these symptoms had substantial impact on daily life and work. I end here by thanking all members of the Patient Led Research Collaborative and Body Politic in UCL for their support. Thanks a lot for your attention.